Okay. Our audiences don't normally give you applause at the beginning, so well done already, Mayor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the London School of Economics for this evening's hybrid event, which forms part of our LSE festival, People and Change, taking place this entire week uh, and exploring how change affects people and how people affect change. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I am the President and Vice Chancellor of the London School of Economics and Political Science. And this, sadly, is my last public event as in that role, uh, because I will be shortly moving to uh, what the mayor refers to as the second greatest city in the world, <laughs> uh, New York. Anyway, I'm very pleased to welcome the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to both our audience here in the room and online. He is, of course, the mayor and born and raised in Tooting, he began his career as a human rights lawyer uh, before being elected to parliament in 2005, the first ever Muslim to be elected to a London seat. He was elected mayor in 2016 and was re-elected in 2021 with a record number of votes for any sitting mayor. He became passionate about air pollution and climate change after developing asthma for the tw as he was preparing for the 2014 London Marathon. And since then, he's been on a mission to make London greener and a city where we can all breathe easily. He still lives in Tooting, which he maintains is the best bit of the best city in the world. <laughs> he has been a frequent visitor to LSE, which is in many ways the perfect place to host this discussion in his book, because we are a global leader in the economics, politics, and sociology of climate change. And our research center, LSE Cities, which is organizing today's event, is, uh, has been at the forefront of research into how cities can address climate change and, and er reduce urban carbon emissions and create cities that are resilient to extreme weather events. During today's event, the mayor and I will have a conversation about his book called Breathe, Tra Tackling the Climate Emergency, which was published just three weeks ago. It is a policy manifesto in which the mayor sets out a seven-step guide to winning support for tough action on climate change. But it's also a very personal book where Sadiq describes his evolution as an environmentalist and some of the setbacks as well as the successes in his attempts to win support for green urbanism. As usual, at the end, there'll be a chance for you to ask your questions. I'll take questions from the audience as well as those online who will use, I hope, the Q&A feature. Uh, and we'll try and get a range of questions from both online and in person. For the Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Festival. And as usual, please put your phones on silent. And we will try and record this event and deliver it as a podcast for wider <laughs> dissemination. Very good. So with that, I'm Okay. So... First and uh, most obviously, the most unusual thing about this book is that you wrote it while you were in office, whereas most politicians write books after they leave office. So it's not a book about settling scores, but one about setting an agenda. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book now, and maybe just give the audience a sense of the main arguments in it. Well, I'll get to your question shortly, but just to say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for this in conversation with. I, I wanted to come for three main reasons. One, because I had to take part in the LSE Festival. It's really important. Uh, secondly, because uh, I'm really sad to see uh, our president uh, leave and say thank you to Manoush for all the work you've done at okay. LSE over the uh, years. But thirdly, to... But, but I was keen to be Minish, Minish's last event at uh, LSC as the, as the president, uh, which goes to my third point, to scotch the rumour that I hate all presidents. <laughs> <laughs> Only those whose first name is Donald and second name is Trump. Not, uh, so the, 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 you, you ask, if we just think about the books we may have read from uh, politicians, Minish is right, they tend to be memoirs uh, after the event, self-serving often. Uh, sometimes entertaining. Uh, but also when you think about uh, books on policy, they tend to be read, written, I say this with huge respect, by academics, uh, but people who haven't got the levers 
and so they can be quite purist. Yeah. Uh, so what I was trying to do is, in real time, tell you uh, my story about the seven obstacles I've uh, faced in relation to having the argument on green issues, climate change and air pollution, winning the arguments on green issues, uh, fighting and winning elections on uh, green issues. And it's not, it's not a political memoir, but it is a personal story in relation to uh, my uh, journey. And my journey is, and I've got to be honest, and I've been candid in uh, the book is, I'm somebody who, when I, was, when I was a human rights lawyer, working just up the road, when I became a salaried partner around I was age 26, 27, I negotiated a car park space for my Saab convertible <laughs> right, in central London. Uh, 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 and then when we had our first child, Anissa, uh, because a two-door convertible is quite difficult to put a car seat in the back, I then bought a Land Rover Discovery. Uh, we left London about four times, never went off-roading. Uh, when I was an MP in 2009, I voted for a third runway at Heathrow. And so I, I tell you that story because that's been my journey. Uh, and you know, Manoush has made one error in her storytelling, which is after running the marathon in 2014, uh, uh, I was diagnosed with adult onset asthma. I'd had a checkup before the marathon, perfectly fit and uh, healthy. And it was explained to me that actually the asthma I was diagnosed with, and I still have, was caused by the environment by this thing we can't see called particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide. And so that led me on this journey of finding out a bit more about this. The same things that cause climate change, by the way, cause air pollution. So it's a, a brilliant two-for-one offer. You fight one, you fight the other. And so that's, that's what the book is about. And I thought, I thought rather than waiting for you know, uh, 25 years when I retire as mayor, uh, <laughs> I, I'd write the book now. So. Many people think that green politics is really a kind of middle and upper class issue and really only a matter for people who already have economic security in their lives. But as you describe in the book, that's not where you're coming from. And so tell us a little bit about where you, how your commitment to environmental causes emerged. And also, as a politician, do you think you could ever make them politically salient enough to become and compete with bread and butter issues like the NHS, housing, jobs, transport, yeah. cost of living? I think your question has encapsulated you know, my motivation for what I'm doing in this issue and writing the book. So look, the sort of lawyer, the sort of lawyer I was, I, I wasn't a corporate lawyer, uh, I was a human rights lawyer. Uh, and I was, when I was a member of parliament uh, and you know, a minister and a cabinet minister and so forth, my motivation always was fighting social injustice and racial injustice. It's, it's quite you know, important to me. Um, uh, and when I discovered that actually the issue of climate change and air pollution is an issue of social justice uh, and racial justice, I asked the question, how many people know this? Uh, what do I mean by that? If you look at, across the globe, it's those in the global south, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the islands of the West Indies, those in Bangladesh, who suffer the worst consequences of climate change, least responsible for climate change on a uh, you know, macro level, on a micro level, when it comes to climate change or air pollution, it's those in London least likely to own a car, Land Rover Discovery, um, uh, uh, you know, those who tend to live on the main roads where there's the worst air, uh, who suffer the worst consequences, they tend to be black Londoners, black Asian, minority ethnic, and poor Londoners. So the, the fight against climate change and the fight against air pollution is an issue of, yes, environment, well, of course we want to save our planet, it's, issue, it's, a, it's a health issue. We want to stop more people dying prematurely, having stunted lungs, getting asthma, cancer, dementia, heart disease, and so forth. But also, it's an issue of social justice and racial justice. It's incredibly important we understand, we understand that. Uh, that being said, you're absolutely right. There are other issues that people think are more important. One of the chapters, one of the chapters in the book, is about you know deprioritizing climate change, air pollution because of other bread and butter issues. But here's here's the thing nobody tells you. If you, for example, replace our energy being run on fossil fuels by renewables, whether it's wind or solar or nuclear, uh, when there is an illegal invasion of Ukraine, you don't see a big spike in energy bills because we're energy secure. Mm -hmm. If you retrofit your homes, uh, insulation, uh, double, triple glazing, uh, proper ventilation, 
it means you're not seeing every month these massive energy bills. So this investment actually saves money, medium to long term, gives us energy security and do address the cost of living crisis. There will always be other issues that in inverted commas take priority. Uh, and in the chapter the, about uh, the priorities, COVID was the obvious one. COVID is so important. Let's ditch our policies on climate change and air pollution. And what we did though, mayors around the globe, is we worked together to, in a sort of, you know, jiu-jitsu move, um, <laughs> to, to paraphrase Churchill, we didn't waste the crisis. We turned the crisis into opportunity, increased fivefold the amount of cycle lanes, widened the uh, uh, pavements, accelerated the progress towards planting new green, uh, trees, green wall uh, buildings and uh, so forth. And I'll say this, uh, today there is an air quality alert in London. Uh, you know, this weekend we have temperatures north of 30 degrees. The air quality alert means, uh, Minouche, that anybody with respiratory issues who's outside breathing the air is causing damage to organs and uh, uh, cells. Uh, and we saw last year temperatures north of 40 degrees. Last year, the London Fire Brigade in one week was the busiest it's been since the Luftwaffe were demolishing buildings in the Second World War. Right? That's how busy we're. So the climate change is happening now and it affects us and that's why it's really important to you know, uh, have these conversations. So in the book you often talk at the same time about air pollution like particulate matter and nitrogen oxides and carbon dioxide. Uh, which is responsible for climate change. And they're obviously different things. Um, you know, you just mentioned a double whammy, but talk a little bit about should, you know, given time is limited, we've got limited resources, should we be focusing on one or the other? Uh, or do you see them as always synergistic? Because clearly there are trade offs in some situations. So, so uh, an error made. 20 years ago was because the evidence was that diesel vehicles uh, uh, emit less carbon. Let's try and get people to buy diesel vehicles rather than petrol. And now the evidence is uh, they, uh, they may uh, uh, have less carbon emissions, but they emit more particular matter, nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxide. Yeah. So the evidence is when it comes to greenhouse, the, the, the boogeyman boogie, is greenhouse emissions, right? We're going to reduce the number of greenhouse emissions to stop our planet increasing north of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Transport is a big factor there. How we make our energy is a big factor there. Our buildings are a big factor uh, there. I'll tell you an amazing stat. Uh, when we introduced the world's first ultra low emission zone in central London, it worked on the principle of polluter pays. If, you're, if your vehicle is polluting, if you're churning out poison, you pay 12 pounds 50 to come into central uh, London. In the first year, uh, we saw a reduction of uh, nitrogen dioxide by 44%, almost half, almost half, 50% reduction in toxicity. We saw a reduction in 27% of particulate matter, and remarkably, we saw a reduction of 12,700 tonnes of carbon dioxide, a 6% reduction, 6% in carbon emissions. When you speak to experts at Imperial College or King's College, World Health Organization, They've never seen a singular policy to be so transformative in a short period of time. Interesting. Okay, so you, you raised the controversial ultra-low emission zone, uh, and when you imposed it, there was a sort of sense that imposing it on inner London, where it's relatively easy to have good public transport and get around, uh, that was okay. But there was huge controversy around... There is huge controversy. There is huge controversy. <laughs> there is huge controversy around imposing it on outer London, where there's le arguably less air pollution and also less public transport. Um, and so some say this policy is against the poor in outer London, uh, who, who tend to drive older petrol and diesel cars. What's your response to that criticism? So chapter five. Uh, uh, <laughs> Book is here. <laughs> it's, it's called hostility. It's called hostility, um, but, but Minish raises a fair point which, which demands addressing. And it goes to my social justice and racial justice point. So around half the households in London, around half the households in London don't own a car. If you look at the 10 boroughs with the largest number of deaths, each year in London there's around 4,000 deaths attributable to air pollution across the country up to 36,000. This is a national issue and across the globe, 9 million. 4,000, 36,000, 9 million. So this is a London issue, a UK issue and a world issue. In fact, air pollution causes more deaths than tobacco. 
So, but if you go to ten, the 10 boroughs in London with the largest number of deaths, all 10 boroughs are in outer London. If you look in London, there are roughly speaking 500,000 people with respiratory conditions like me with asthma. Almost two thirds live in, guess where? Outer London. But Manoush raises a good point. The alternative to the car must be attractive, mm. otherwise you inadvertently uh, don't give people an incentive other than the stick to move to public transport, walking or uh, cycling. So we're doing a number of things. First, we've got to improve public transport in London, and we are, and I'll give examples later on if it comes up in, in questions and uh, answers. But secondly, we've got to give people support. It's what the, um, the, the, the academics, the policy wonks called a just transition. Uh, what that means is we've got to support people to transition from something that's polluting that's killing people, that's you know, killing our planet, something that's not. And so we pre I previously announced a scrappage scheme of £61 million, not a penny of support from the government, £61 million, which was used up. So I recently announced a further scrappage scheme of £110 million. Anybody who receives child benefit can apply. Any small business that employs uh, less than 50 people, that's 98% of our businesses, can apply. There's exemptions and grace of those who are disabled, uh, charities, um, uh, you know, and so we're supporting um, people to make that just transition. Here's the good news. When I first uh, uh, launched the policy in 2017, the number of compliant vehicles, in other words, those that didn't have to pay, was 39%. So in other words, uh, when I first announced the policy, 61% of Londoners had a vehicle that wasn't compliant, would have to pay £12.50. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, we got the latest data. That 39% of vehicles that are compliant, brackets clean, close brackets, has gone from 39% to 95% in inner London. In outer London, uh, more than 9 out of 10 cars that are driven there, vehicles that are driven there, more than 9 out of 10 are now uh, compliant. So that shows the, 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 the behaviour change that you can get. We're still trying to help those who are non-compliant mm -hmm. to make that uh, transition. And it's really important when you're having the argument, you understand the legitimate concerns, you've got to address them, but also be aware of a vocal minority, often backed up by vested interest, often uh, you know, there's a, other people latch onto it, some of whom are conspiracy theorists, some of whom are the same people who denied that vaccines work and were against the lockdowns. And so you've got to be a bit careful and don't allow the vocal minority to drown out the silent majority who do want action on climate change and air pollution, but also address the legitimate concerns that people have about this um, policy. Okay. So let me ask you about navigating that, those critics on both sides. And you've had, you've had criticism from the right on ULES, and but you've also had criticisms from the left who argue that, well, you're being inconsistent, you supported the Heathrow Third Runway, the Silvertown Tunnel Project, uh, which some people say encourages more car traffic rather than less. What do you say to those more natural political allies who say, well, you've been too friendly to business interests and the growth agenda and not serious enough about climate change? I say speak to the local minority against you guys. <laughs> um, there's, there's a serious point, which is, which is I, I, remember, I remember having a Hustings here in 2016. Uh, uh, the Tory chap was somebody called Zach Goldsmith. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the way, every, every Tory who loses an oral election goes in the House of Lords. <laughs> um, uh, uh, which is why so many applied this time. Uh, and so, and so one of the, one of the, the, one of the, I remember, I remember one of the discussions we had there was the cynicism uh, that people had about politicians who make big promises about green issues before an election yeah. and then forget about it after an election because of priorities, right? You mentioned the inverted commas bread and, bread and butter uh, issues. And so you look at our policies over the last uh, seven uh, years, we've gone from being at the back of the pack in relation to green issues uh, in 2016 to now being a world leader in relation to you know, green in London, uh, you know, the number of trees we planted, our, our London plan in relation to all new buildings that are going to be uh, air quality positive, uh, and net zero in relation to cycling, in relation to walking, in relation to uh, freezing fares for the first five years of my mayoralty in relation to cleaning up the uh, air. But let me deal directly with the issue of um, uh, the Silvertown uh, Tunnel. So for those that know uh, London very well, basically, if you stand on Tower Bridge, well, it, it, the shorthand is the poorest part of London forever has been the East End. Uh, and one, one of the things that regenerates an area is good transport links. If you stand on Tower Bridge and look west, 
you see at least 18 bridges uh, going west, mm -hmm. uh, including that lovely bridge up the road here, uh, Waterloo Bridge. You look east, there's only one crossing. Yeah. Um, and so the most unreliable bus in London is the Route 108 single decker that uses the Blackwall Tunnel. That's the, the crossing that exists in that part of uh, London. The Blackwall Tunnel was built in Victorian times, I think 1897. The Blackwall Tunnel is built with a, with a, with a curve in it to stop horses bolting when they see sunlight. Uh, not many people use a horse to go through a silver tunnel in 2023. On an average year, in an average year, that tunnel is closed 500 times because uh, the car's breaking down, it's single lane going either way, problems with the tunnel, 500 times. Each five minute, each time it's closed, for five minutes, it leads to a three mile tailback, all right? Nobody wants to use a bus because it's, you're stuck in the tailback. It leads to bad air quality, it leads to congestion, it leads to people you know, not being confident in using the bus. What we're doing is uh, building a tunnel with two lanes reserved uh, for double-decker buses, double-decker buses, re reserved. So no other vehicle besides a double-decker bus uh, and a HGV can go through those two lanes. Another, uh, another lane for, for vehicles. Mm. It will be told, uh, as will the Blackwall Tunnel, uh, it will be within the ultra-low emission zone, and there are air quality monitors there now, and the requirement is going to be air quality neutral or air quality positive. So it's a pragmatic solution to a problem that demands addressing, and here's the good news. It will lead to better air quality, less uh, congestion, but also it will regenerate that part of London, which for too long it's has been neglected. Okay. So you mentioned that London has become a leader globally now on climate change. You are chair of something called the C40 Climate Change Leadership Group, which is a global network of large cities uh, battling climate change. What role do you think those kind of international networks play in advancing policy? And are there any particular cities or mayors who you admire, who you think we can learn from? Look, well, this year we're going to have COP28 in, in um, that world leader, Dubai, uh, uh, on green issues. Um, and uh, Chapter 7 is called Gridlock, which deals with this, this issue, by the way. But actually, a lot of people are frustrated about a lack of progress we make at the various COPs. We're now going to be at COP28 to question what progress made since Paris in 2015. Um, and so one of the things, I, one of the schools of thought I subscribe to is, uh, uh, it's a quote said by a former mayor in a, an American city, and he said, if the 19th century will be known as a century of empire, and the 20th century as a century of uh, nations and states, the 21st century is about cities and mayors. Mm -hmm. And why do we think that? A greater urbanization me means that more and more people move into cities. Roughly speaking, 50% now are going to be 65% 60, over the course of the next 10 years, partly because of climate displacement, by the way. Mm. You, you go to Dakar, they're seeing 20,000 new people every day because of the, 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 you know, the, the, the sea rising on the coastal parts of uh, Bangladesh. And so, uh, you know, cities have been the problem in the past. I think we can be the solution. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, because we're nimble, we're dexterous, we haven't got parliaments to worry about so much, vested interests to worry about so much, we're nearer to our people. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing stat. Of, of the roughly 200, 200 countries that signed the Paris Accord in 2015, about 200 countries, there's only one on course to meet the obligations made, one. You compare the uh, uh, 97 cities who are members of C40, uh, more than two thirds are on, are on course to meet Paris or ahead. More than three quarters of the cities uh, in C40 are going much further uh, than the national uh, uh, government. And the sort of cities that are part of C40, you know, I've got the privilege to be, to be in the chair, uh, are, you know, are, are the second greatest city in New York. Um, <laughs> so Paris, Barcelona, Los Angeles, but also the Dakars, the Freetals, the Accras, uh, and uh, so forth. And there are cities doing amazing stuff. You know, Anne Hidalgo in Paris doing some great stuff in relation to greening up the city, encouraging people to walk and uh, uh, cycle. Uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, before he became the ambassador to, to India, really good stuff in relation to alternative sources of uh, energy. Uh, the, the, the outgoing mayor of Barcelona, great stuff in relation to work done in relation to encouraging people to, 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 to walk. The mayor of Freetown, Freetown's now Freetown Tree Town. Uh, she's <laughs> planting you know, almost a million trees. Helps with landslides, mm. but also basic photosynthesis as well. As well, Accra, 
changed their waste systems, and it led to a massive reduction in uh, you know, uh, air pollution, uh, but also uh, water pollution uh, as well. So you know, cities really are you know, leading the way. Our frustration is we're not in the room where it happens, to paraphrase Hamilton. And so one of the things we're, 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 we're doing with the UN, uh, and the current you know, SG is fantastic, Ateros is fantastic, is trying to say, listen, um, you know, if you want to see an example of you know, bold, brave leadership, go to cities and mayors because we're doing it. Yeah. And you know, we're hoping to have some impact at, at, the, at you know, the General Assembly later on uh, this year. But you know, we, we've got to be hopeful. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things about the book is it's hopeful because it, you know, in London, we've been transformative in a few years. I see an amazing, uh, uh, I shouldn't refer to other universities, but another great university in London, King's College. <laughs> uh, uh, they, 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 when I first became mayor, they, they did some work and they've done some work since. Uh, they said, you know, using the policies before I became mayor, it would take 193 years to bring our air within legal limits. They now say we can do it by 2025. That shows a difference, you know, bold, brave leadership can make. And we want, you know, national governments to see the difference cities and mayors are making and follow our lead. Yeah. Okay, one last question from me. I'm going to change the subject before turning to the audience in the room. Uh, Brexit. You've been a very... Can I just say... Um, <laughs> so so this, is, this is the longest period I've been at an LSE event where the B word's not been mentioned. <laughs> I actually remember uh, being on the steps of the old building when you came here to speak in the midst of Brexit stuff about Brexit. I think you were here with oh, the then head of the European Parliament. And uh, I, there were a bunch of journalists on the steps of the old building. And I said, what are you all doing here? They said, oh, it's the Econs. You're talking about Brexit. This is the only place in the country where there's a rigorous debate about Brexit. So, <laughs> so I have to ask you about Brexit. You have been a vocal critic, and you have called your party's vow of silence on the damage it has wrought on the country damaging. Uh, now, of course, London, in London, 60% of the population voted Remain. So that definitely speaks to your constituency. But the road that your party has to travel to national victory also goes through many leave-supporting seats. Um, so. Are you helping or hurting your party in terms of with these statements? Do you think Labour has been hurt by its current position on Brexit, or do you think they could be more forward-leaning and still achieve national victory? What time do we have to leave the building by? <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you the, 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 so the short answer is this, look, it, it, you know, there's been many occasions since 2016 where I've been tempted to uh, unilaterally declare independence. Uh, and for, <laughs> you know, for London to become a city-state. Uh, I, I, I quite like the sound of El Presidente. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Another president you'd like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Whether you voted to remain in the EU, whether you voted to leave the EU, whether you were old enough to vote in the referendum, or whether you were uh, allowed to vote in the referendum, um, I'm quite old-fashioned, not just because I used to be a lawyer, uh, but I think you look at the evidence. Just look at the evidence. I mean, that, that's been my journey with air pollution, right? Um, and the evidence is Brexit has been an unmitigated disaster for our country. That's the evidence. Uh, economically, socially, and culturally. And you can take each in turn. Uh, you know, the, 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 the GDP of our country, the growth in our country, uh, is smaller than it otherwise would be. You speak to any of your neighbours, friends or colleagues whose country of origin is Italy or France or Spain and they're being honest with you, uh, they're heartbroken at the idea that they're seen as uh, the other. There are people who would otherwise have come to the LSEs or other universities in London and across our country who are not now coming because of the difficulties us being outside the European uh, Union. Uh, and I think it's been a colossal mistake. That being said, I, I respect, uh, as I used to when I was a lawyer, the verdict of the jury, right? The British public voted to leave the European Union. But here's the irony. The people trying to make Brexit a success aren't the Brexiteers. They've vacated the pitch, right, as we saw this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
David's right. It's from, the irony is it's Remainers that are trying to make this thing uh, work. And the way you make this thing less painful is convergence with the EU, not divergence. We've got on our doorstep, talking in crude terms, a market of 500 million. You speak to a small business, a medium business, a big business, they will say the customers they do the most business with are their neighbours. Right, and, and we're, we're, we think divergence is the way to do well with the European Union. All this discussion this week, it's London Tech Week, uh, and I've been busy with, with that. All this, all this discussion that Sunak, our Prime Minister, is having about you know London being the AI capital of the world. Well, the US is, is you know 300 million people. Right, the EU is 500 million people. I'm not being funny. A country of 65 million. What influence do we have in relation to geopolitics? In relation to uh, regulation around EI and so forth. And I think, uh, whatever metrics you use, I think we're poorer as a consequence of leaving the EU. But I've got to be honest, because of the referendum, I think for for foreseeable future, for a generation maybe, uh, you know, we can't you know rejoin the EU. But we should be having a debate about things like it being less painful joining the single market, joining the customs union, having uh, convergence. I think uh, my point was the government, Brexiteers, have taken a vow of silence in relation to discussing uh, the B word. Uh, I mean, the B word is not discussed anywhere in you know national politics, which I think is is a mistake. You've got to be honest. Uh, you've got to be honest, people. Uh, you know, you know, you're not insulting them by saying, "Listen, you know, the sunny uplands, sunny uplands haven't come." Even those that will say to you now, "I don't mind being poorer because we've got autonomy." Well, I'm not being funny. What autonomy? You, you, you know, what, what autonomy? Um, Johnson decided he goes in the House of Lords. That, you know, so rather than people in the European Parliament elected decide what happens, you've got you know the Prime Minister's cronies deciding who gets PPE contracts, who gets contracts to do with the uh, pandemic, who gets in the House of Lords. I mean, how's that control? And so I think we've got to be honest about this. And you know, it, it breaks my heart that I meet younger Londoners who won't benefit from being members of the European Union. It upsets me um, that I see people struggling because of us being outside the EU. And what's worse is the extreme hard Brexit we have is the worst of all worlds. Uh, and that's why it's incredibly important that we have the honest discussion and, you know, uh, you know uh, we've got to have the discussion. Okay. Okay. So I am going to take three questions from the audience, if that's all right. Sure. And then we'll turn to the online audience. And let's see how we are doing. I will take... Uh, I always like to start with a woman. Can I have a woman? Yes, there you are, right there. <laughs> right there, and then I'll take the gentleman in front of you and the one right behind there, and then I'll come back, don't worry. Hi, um, I'm Asma. I'm a resident of Harrogate. I'm just here um, in the middle. Um, and so my question is, is about um, more on the climate change side. So you've talked a little bit about um, having autonomy and some of the powers that you've been able to use um, as, uh, as a city mayor. What powers would you like to take from Westminster in order to fulfil your ambitions? And how would you go about ensuring that you had accountability for how you went about using them and showed Londoners that it was a good idea that you got them? Okay, good question. Let's turn to the gentleman here, yeah, in the white shirt, right, right in front of you, white shirt, and then the one in behind. Yeah. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that uh, discussion. My name is Jeremy Curdy. Um, so I was wondering, you've been uh, successful, um, obviously, in regional politics and national politics. What is the one thing that you would like to see individuals do to combat climate change, perhaps uh, regional governments to do more differently or better to combat climate change, and nationally, what is the one thing that you think uh, could be done? Okay. And then the gentleman right back there. Yeah. I'll come back to this section later. Good afternoon, sir. It's a pleasure see seeing you again. The last time, uh, I'm, I'm Karnveer Mundre. I'm the chair of Bangalore Alumni Group. Uh, last time we met in Bombay on, on yes. your trip. Uh, my question is, since you talk about statistics, a little touchy topic, but uh, according to statistics and science, air pollution is caused only 20% by, by vehicular traffic and 60 to 70% by animal farming. So if we are actually looking at uh, combating air pollution, I think we should also give some voice to reduction in animal farming and uh, probably be, uh, vegetarian. I mean, I'm not promoting that, but. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. 
So the, 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 old, the old trick when you're a politician is take questions in rounds of three and you duck the difficult ones. Exactly. <laughs> but I won't, I won't do that because Manoush won't let me. Um, so, so, so Asma, th thanks for your question. So, so look, so, so uh, our country is uh, probably the most centralised democracy in the Western world. Uh, you know, I say that knowing that Professor Teddy Travis is in the, is in the front, front row. Um, and so the short thing is, you know, if we're going to address climate change, we've got to be less, less centralised. And I think the government can do a number of things. I'll give you an amazing stat. So I get to spend 7% of taxes raised in London, 7%. London government gets to spend 7% of taxes raised in London. The mayor of New York, Eric Adams, gets mm. to spend 50% of monies raised in New York. The governor and mayor of Tokyo, 70%. So we get very, we've got very little autonomy. Uh, over how money is spent. We've got, to, we've got to go with the begging bowl to the government and say, listen, can you give us some, some money? And for the last three years, they've excluded, ex excluded London from many of the, the pots of money uh, we can't even bid for. And so Tony, did, Tony was on a commission called the London Finance Commission. Uh, I, I, so th the former mayor, he whose name we don't mention, uh, <laughs> he, he, he asked um, Voldemort. He asked, <laughs> he, he asked he asked Tony and a number of others to do a report with the London Finance Commission. What more powers does London need? It, it, you know, he becomes the Prime Minister and gives us none of those powers. Um, <laughs> but I then commissioned Tony and, and the team to do a second uh, London Finance Commission report. And so we, we've done the work in relation to what additional powers we need in relation to fiscal devolution, other things to you know, make sure, rather than us going with a begging bowl, we have more of the taxes raised in London, London kept in London. So the, 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 at the moment, we, we give to the Treasury each year net £42 billion, pounds, and I, I, that's our responsibility to do so. We're the capital city, it's right we do so. What I'm saying to the government is give us, devolve us more powers and resources, we could contribute even more than £42 billion pounds to the national coffers, coffers. So we are keen to get more devolution. And that would help in the fight against climate change and uh, air pollution. A policy that's good in London may not be one that's useful in Bristol or Manchester or Liverpool or you know, Cardiff or Glasgow or, or elsewhere. That's a really important thing you know, the government could do. And hopefully next year, when there's a change of government, uh, we'll persuade the Labour government to, 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 to do that, uh, assuming they're still talking to me after Manoush's question about Brexit. Um, <laughs> in relation to um, uh, the really good question in relation to what can we do, look, can I say, I am not the perfect green activist, uh, and it's really important that I say that. I'm not a vegan. Uh, I, I will still fly, I'll, I'll offset, uh, and I'll still sometimes take the advice of my production team and jump in a car, right? Um, uh, and so we mustn't assume, unless you're a perfectionist, there's nothing you can do, right? It's really important. What I'm trying to do is turn passive consumers into active citizens, right? So, because many of us are passive consumers, uh, and I think there's a responsibility to be a, a, a citizen and an active citizen. And so there are things, you know, that we can all do, you know, individually, uh, you know, simple things. You know, I won't patronise you by saying what they are, but there are things we, the government can do. And so you compare and contrast what President Biden's doing. The Inflation Reduction Act, a massive stimulus. I mean, it's a massive stimulus in the green economy. Yeah. I mean, there are businesses I've spoken to, I won't name them, who are going to America because of the... the yeah, because the, of the subsidies. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's really a clever way of active industrial policy. Yeah. The scale actually is bigger than what FDR did, in the, according to experts, you know yeah. better than I do. Yeah. It's huge. And so that's stimulating the green economy. And here's the beauty of it. It's making that just transition. So if you worked in car manufacturing, making, you know, internal combustion engine petrol, diesel, you're worried about your factory closing down, you'll be out of work. Well, hold on a sec. This subsidy means you can open an electric car factory in that same city and trans skin up these people and transition and so forth. So the stuff that we, we need a, a similar act in our country. Uh, secondly, the evolve of powers and resources to regions and uh, mayors and national governments. And thirdly, the same, there's the wonderful, wonderful woman called Rosamond Ella Kissy Deborah. Uh, she had a daughter called Ella. And Ella uh, tragically died aged nine in 2013 because of air pollution. And Rosamond campaigned to have a second inquest where the coroner for the first time said air pollution was, the, was one of the reasons why she died. Years ago, we wouldn't attribute tobacco smoking to lung cancer. Years ago, we wouldn't attribute obesity to heart issues. And uh, uh, Ella's case is really remarkable. One of the things Rosamond's campaigning for is Ella's law for us to reach the WHO targets for clean air by 2030 rather than 2040. That's, those are the three things I do. Inflation Reduction Act, Development of Powers, and Ella's Law. Uh, and third question from a friend from Mumbai. Uh, um, 
is, you're right, so, so the, 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 there are a number of reasons for air pollution. Um, I, I break them down in a city, because uh, we've not got many um, animals uh, on pastures in London, as, you know, transport, housing and offices, but you're right in relation to farming. And so I think you should be, my point in relation to things we can do as an active citizen is, yeah, eat less meat. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I eat far less meat now than I used to in yesteryear. Got rid of the Saab, the Land Rover, and less meat. There are little <laughs> things you can do, right? Um, there are things you can do uh, in relation to walking and cycling rather than, you know, jumping in the car, using public transport, active travel. Amazing stat. Two thirds, two thirds of car journeys in London, two thirds, can be walked or cycled in less than 20 minutes. Just think about that. It's true. And of course, farming practices in India are a really good example of why Delhi is so polluted, for example. And so, very good point. I'm going to take three more from the audience here. Uh, so, I'll take this gentleman here, you over here, and let me get one, the woman with the black thing. Okay, so right here, the blue, oh, the, oh sorry, no, the blue shirt in the back. A little further back. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Uh, very, a big, very big thank you. Uh, my name is Adam. I am a double degree student uh, here at the LSE in Colombia. Uh, my question is uh, more specifically about you speak of the fundamental challenges faced by many of the cities in the C40, obviously air pollution, rising sea levels, congestion and resource shortages. London is an immensely privileged city compared to such cities. What are the most impactful insights on public policy that you can share to support uh, such cities to combat such omnipresent challenges, which will no doubt only worsen moving forward. Thank you. Okay, and then the second one, uh, yeah, the, the gentleman in the white shirt there, and then the in here, yeah, perfect. Um, hi, Sadiq, uh, my name's Ben Young. Uh, first of all, um, May Mavis from Crockerton Roads would like to say hello to you. I'm sure you remember her from way yeah. back when. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, and my second question is, you, you mentioned uh, Rosamund uh, Kisiado. Um, I just noticed today that she uh, came out very strongly about uh, against LTNs. Uh, and she mentioned the issue of uh, environmental racism, that uh, LT LTN shift traffic onto roads where poor people live. Uh, what, what is your take on that? And how can this be reconciled? Okay. Great question. And we turn to the woman over here. Hi, um, my name is Emma. I'm a master's student here at the LSE. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on anaerobic digestion facilities, um, how they might play a role in uh, renewable energy in the future for London, as well as stabilizing energy and fertilizer prices, reducing landfill waste, and also reducing the UK's dependence on um, other countries for energy. Great. I love the first questions from where Manoush is going, and the last questions from where she's leaving. That's so right. <laughs> Columbia and LSC in the house. Uh, so, look, so, so, all, all great questions. So, so, here's the thing about cities. I'm making a generalisation. In cities, you tend to have people who are uh, educated. I don't mean in a patronising way, but you know, you do more graduates in, in, in cities. Younger are more diverse. Um, and that's interesting, interesting dynamic in relation to cities and how bold we can be. Uh, the key thing is taking the voters with you, right? Because none no, no of us wants to lose our job. Uh, and, you know, and so I wouldn't dare you know, give Eric advice in New York and stuff, but we, we do talk regularly, mayors around the world. The biggest thing I, we, I think we can do is uh, in relation to education, small e, non-patronising. One, one of the quotes in my book is from somebody that Ricky and Tony know well, Tony Benn. Tony Benn once said, the best politicians are teachers. I think what's happening with politicians is we've lost the art to be teachers. Because we think everything's going to be put down in 280 characters or you know, in a short you know, eight minute speech. Uh, you know, and the reason why I wrote the book actually was you can develop arguments and tell a story and you know, use more than primary colors. And we've got to educate our you know, consumers to become citizens and the need for, for prevention being an enabler to bring about transformative change. And public education is so, so important in relation to public health, in relation to the future jobs that comes in a second, and so forth. And I think what, what mayors have got to do is, is educate their constituents, brackets, voters. They get, they get permission to do bold policies, and then they, they get re-elected. And that's what we're grappling with the C40, because all of us, most of us, are, are democratically elected. 
and some are appointed by governments. That's why it's a bit. So, so, but how do you win the argument and win elections? And, and that's ostensibly one of the reasons I wrote the book. When I was running to be the chair of C40, I was campaigning because there's an election. And a lot, a lot of mayors were asking me, how did you do what you did? And I said, listen, I'll, I'll, you know, you should, they said you should write a book. And obviously, I'll write the book, right? And so, the, and, the, and, and so that's the key thing. In a democracy, how, you, how can you win the next election based on what you've done? I think you can only do it by educating people, getting permission to do the bold stuff. And we're all grappling with how to do that. The mayor of Barcelona, a wonderful woman, Ada Kahlo, lost recently. Bold mayor doing bold things, but she lost the election. Right? So that may make people nervous about doing bold things. And that's, we've not got the answer. That's, that's the big challenge we have. The book's the answer. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Ben, great question. And so for those that don't know, so what Ben's alluding to is, so low traffic neighbourhoods are, are, are a really good idea. The idea is to reduce traffic, who could be against that, uh, to encourage people to walk, cycle, use public transport. If, not, if, if done improperly, it can lead to do what's called displacement. So this part of a neighbourhood doesn't allow, I'm, I'm generalising, doesn't allow cars to go down there. Um, but those cars may go to another part of the wide, bigger neighbourhood. And the concern is the cars that are avoiding the side roads, brackets, rat runs, are going to the main roads. Now, why that's important in the context of racial justice, poorer black people, black Asian, minority ethnic, tend to live on the main roads above shops and so forth. So an unintended consequence of a bad LTN is you're displacing traffic to a road where poorer uh, and or uh, black Asian, minority ethnic uh, people live. Good councils, though, are, are doing proper work in advance of an LTN going permanent. So the reason why this happened, Ben, was because the government in 2021, you know, Johnson's government, uh, was giving money to councils to do LTNs by a certain day. They had a deadline. If a council did an LTN by a certain day, they got money to do it. So councils rushed to get their schemes in and often didn't work them through properly or didn't you know, properly engage. The good councils already had ready-made schemes. They landed well. They tweaked them a bit, they landed well. Uh, other councils rushed, and they landed badly, and that was an unintended consequence. But what I said to councils, is, as a council decision, is look, before a scheme becomes permanent, it's really important you consult, but also look at some of the work in relation to, is there displacement? The good news is, by and large, it leads to less car use, it doesn't lead to displacement, it leads to better quality air, the local shops benefiting from the walk passing traffic. But Ben's right, we've got to be a bit careful about those schemes that are imperfect and some of the consequences they uh, lead to. Emma, you're spot on in relation to looking into uh, you know, the, the anaerobic issues, but also using heat to create energy is one of the, one of the things we could be looking into. We're, we're doing some work in relation to the heat on our underground system, they're, they're pretty hot today, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in relation to energy and so forth. One of the things we're trying to do, Emma, is, is, is pilot and test things. Some things are gonna succeed, some things are gonna fail. We've got, to be, we've got to be risk takers to get the reward. And so what we're doing in City Hall is we've got um, uh, a sum of money we've set aside, uh, uh, green finance to set up green bonds, uh, to try and encourage people to take a bit of risk in relation to those sorts of issues, because there is uh, an issue in relation to what we do with the heat we capture. Can we capture the heat and use it for good reasons? We can't get it, we can't get it down to zero. What the, the underground needs to run right. There's gonna be heat generated anywhere. In relation to you know, um, uh, waste, we've got to reduce waste as well. There should be no reason to have incinerate, any more incinerators in London. We've got plenty of capacity there. One of the, one of the things about devolution is you've got you know, devolution downwards as well. So we've got 32 boroughs in London. You've got fewer boroughs in New York, you're lucky. 32 boroughs in London. Each borough has its own uh, recycling and waste system. Mm. It's got its own contract. They can't even agree which day of the week to collect refuse on. We're trying to work with them to coordinate, to encourage more you know, recycling, more reusing and more reduction. Uh, the good news is we're making progress with the councils. The bad news, because we've got so many flats in London, transit population, it's quite difficult. But that, that's, that's the name of the game in relation to how we can use the bad stuff for a good stuff and let's test in the process. Although, given that I'm moving house, we went to Southwark Recycling Centre last weekend. My husband went and he came back singing the praises of the circular economy in Great. operation. Everything was being recycled, yeah. kettles, yeah. old phones. It's quite impressive, actually. Yeah. There's a lot happening. Labour Southwark. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, I'm going to turn to the online audience now. Uh, let me turn to, uh, to Anna, who will re give us three questions from the online Sure, audience. yeah, plenty coming in here. So the first, touching on something you raised earlier, apart from the proposed Superloop orbital bus services, service you're currently introducing, what other plans do you have to improve public transport in outer London? Second question coming in from Farad Rajan in Mumbai. So the question is, industries are a big contributor to air pollution. How do we put a stop to industrial pollution while also not ignoring perhaps necessary industrial growth needed by developing nations? And the third question, you have a homes building target which you're reporting on. Are you going to introduce a retrofitting homes target to improve their environmental impact so we can hold you to account for that as well? Okay. Great. So, so the first question is really important uh, in relation to the context of the US discussion. So uh, we, we've massively improved public transport in, our, in outer London, but we're going to do much more. So some examples of the improvements in outer London so far, the Elizabeth Line runs from east to west to our city. Many uh, of uh, the areas in outer London now are covered by uh, the Elizabeth Line. We've ordered new trains on the Docklands Light Railway, which uh, have started arriving air-conditioned, uh, like the Elizabeth Line really important. We extended the overground train to Barkin Riverside, really important to support that part of outer London. And we're working to extend uh, the DLR to Thames Reach um, and Galleons Reach, which is really important. The Superloop, though, is, is, is incredibly exciting as well. The Superloop is an orbital bus route, uh, uh, which, which will, will be transformative for those parts of uh, London, four million kilometres of additional bus services in the Superloop. And I've set aside a separate pot of six million pounds for another million kilometres of bus uh, uh, in outer London, but we've really got to invest in public transport in outer London. It's, it's incredibly important to us, and we're going to invest over the next period, as we have in the uh, past. The industrial pollution point is really important. It goes back to the uh, IRA uh, in, that, that President Biden's uh, doing. Growth per se, not, you know, shouldn't be the, the aim. The aim should be good growth. Uh, and what President Biden has done is he's uh, attached conditions and strings to the stimulus mm. that he's putting into uh, the, the American economy. Uh, th there's um, a wonderful uh, academic called um, Mariana, Mariana Mazzucato who talks about the importance of the missions approach uh, and not being scared to attach conditions to uh, you know, subsidy and so forth. And I think when it comes to in our industrial policy, this government's been too laissez-faire at the market decide. Uh, the market without some interference doesn't work. And so I think it's really important that we have a policy of good growth. We've got that in London in relation to the monies we give. It's got to be good growth. Simple things, not just in terms of the green economy, but are you paying the living wage? Are you making sure your workforce is diverse? Are you looking at procurement chain and so forth? It's really, really important. And the last thing uh, in relation to the housing question is, uh, uh, Anna didn't mention this but, uh, uh, because it wasn't asked in the question, but I, I've got to mention it because I'm an audience is we are now building more council homes than any time since the 1970s, uh, which is fantastic. We're now completing more homes than any time since the 1930s, and they're all air quality positive, but the real prize is the retrofit. Because, uh, so the good news, all the new stuff is brilliant. Uh, they have uh, cheaper builds, energy efficient, uh, carbon friendly, and so forth. But the real prize is the retrofit of the offices and the homes. So uh, Germany is spending tenfold what we're spending in relation to heat pumps and retrofit and so forth. We're not, uh, but we need, we need government support. What we're trying to say to the government is if you invest in this, uh, the money comes back because you create future-proof jobs. Who's going to fit the solar panels, the wind turbines, electric vehicle charging points? Who's going to be the insulators? Who's going to do uh, the electric vehicle charging points? So we're trying to encourage the government to do what Joe, President Biden's done in relation to that. In London, what we're doing with the limited funding we have We've got something called the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund. Uh, the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund. And we, we are supporting retrofit of um, public buildings, councils, uh, you know, uh, big, uh, and uh, council estates. What we need is the real prizes over occupies, uh, individual homes on our streets. But we can't do that. Don't we? Okay. I think we are. Out of time. Oh, would you, okay. would you like some more questions? I'm, sure I'm I, happy, yeah. Yes, should we have one more round of three? Sure, sure. Uh, should I check with your team before they shout at me? I yeah, don't look at them. Don't, always <laughs> don't look at them. All right, we're just carrying on. A... I think there's a woman here who'd like a question. There's a gentleman in the back, and maybe I'll take the person, the, yeah, right there, the blue t shirt. Yeah. Well, I'd like to ask you about. 
I'd like to ask you about housing because you, you're very keen on uh, the housing, uh, on, on increased housing. Uh, and if that's the case, how do you reconcile that with your, with your uh, attitudes about pollution sure. uh, and uh, pollution? Okay. Uh, let's take the, the person in the back there, yeah, with the blue shirt, high hand, and then this one here. This one in the blue T-shirt right back there, yeah. Hi there, thanks for today. Um, I'm a resident of East Greenwich, a few streets away from the Blackwall Tunnel, uh, where obviously pollution, Ulez and neighbouring Bexley and the Silvertown Tunnel are all very topical. Um, I recently went to a local council meeting where residents were invited to suggest alterations to traffic systems in the area, and it essentially descended into complete chaos, whereby everyone wants to, everyone wants to divert the traffic away from their own street. Um, <laughs> and I, I really felt for the councillors, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure there's all that much they can do, and uh, I'm told that in decades nothing's really changed there. Um, the most radical project is obviously, dare I say, your Silvertown Tunnel. Um, I think it seems like a good idea, I tend to agree with you, but there's so much objection to it. Are, are you sure all those people are wrong? And finally, if um, you know, we can get all these new double-decker buses through it, which is great, do you honestly think it's fair that, that normal people can barely afford the uh, bus fares when, I think it was yesterday it was announced that TfL fat cats were lining their pockets with bonuses again? Okay. Question and over here. Mr. Mayor, um, one of the things which you understandably push up for as part of your environmental cause is an increase in cycling, and that's very admirable. But as you'll be aware, there is a small but sizable minority of cyclists who disregard red lights, who ignore zebra crossings, <laughs> who ride rod trot on pavements. So my question to you is, do you agree with me that Cyclists are effectively exempt from the highway code, and if not, what are you going to do to increase enforcement? We've all been knocked over by those men in Lycra, huh? Exactly. <laughs> they, they come in other genders too, by the way. So, 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 so actually, the first question is incredibly important. So cities, uh, because we have greater densities, uh, are more carbon friendly. Uh, than, with, than you'd think. So actually, one of the ways we've managed to make progress in relation to reducing carbon footprint is by being more dense. So if you just think about it logically, if you live uh, in rural parts of the country, um, uh, the, 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 the carbon, footprint, carbon footprint of an individual is far greater than it is for those of us living in London. A use of public transport, whether we can walk, whether we can cycle, the, the, the amount of square meters we're taking and who's living there and so forth. So that greater urbanisation isn't a problem. More people moving to cities is not a problem as long as we plan for that and plan properly and stuff. That's why you know, these sort of conversations are really important. We're going to build sufficient numbers of homes. They're going to be genuinely affordable. We're going to build GP practices, at decent schools and so forth. So this, this comes up regularly when I talk to people who are anti-immigration. And I say, listen, the reason why you can't get affordable housing, the reason why you can't get a kid into a decent school, the reason why you, uh, your, your parent can't get the date for an operation isn't because of migrants. It's because governments haven't built enough genuinely affordable homes. They've not invested in the NHS. They've not invested in uh, schooling. Actually, the reason why there's a longer delay, there aren't enough migrant doctors to, to treat and so forth. So cities, more people living in cities isn't a problem as long as we plan for that. It's really important we, we plan for that. You know, we, we reduce carbon emissions by 6% in our city just in one year because of the uh, uh, ULES. And so I think we can be the answer to the problems rather than being the problem. By the way, in the past, we caused the problems. So a lot of the responsibility for climate change is with the cities in the past. But in the 1950s, the Clean Air Act you know, removed power stations from the centre of our cities because of the great smog. Uh, and I think on this generation to sort out air pollution and uh, quite, yeah, but it's, sorry? Right. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if those families who have been rehoused would agree with you, uh, or, the, or, or the people who have now got a decent GP service would agree with you, or those who have now got a decent school with a decent uh, classroom size to go to would agree with you, or the LSE, which has expanded lovely in this nice uh, in this. I mean, the, the theatre rooms used 20 years ago were awful. 
Uh, I'm sure Tony and Ricky would agree. Uh, uh, question from Inscrewage. Really, you raised a number of points uh, related to your question in Inscrewage. Let me, let me do with each of them. So, uh, TfL was formed in 2000, as Tony will tell you. And for the first 16 years of TfL's history, the first 16 years, TfL made uh, an operating loss. 2016 is the first year uh, they didn't make an, an operating uh, uh, loss. We reduced the deficit year on year for the, for the first time in history in the last seven years, we removed the, the flab. Uh, and for the first time ever next year, uh, we won't require any support from the government in relation to uh, uh, revenue. And so we can make a difference uh, working closely with our staff, including you know, through trade unions and so forth. So I don't accept the caricature of TFL staff getting fat bonuses and stuff. Many of them lost their lives during the pandemic and they worked incredibly hard to keep our city uh, going. In relation to the, the, the really important point you raised in relation to a vocal minority and a silent majority and stuff and being confident in the policies, it goes back to the point I made in relation to Brexit, um, which is the evidence. But also, we do get wobbly when it comes to the noise from the vocal minority because you're right. You start thinking, oh my God, everyone believes this, right? So uh, uh, I, I do it in the book. Uh, you've got to check the pulse of the people. You've got to check the silent majorities with you and stuff. And Silvertown was an issue in the 2021 campaign and the election uh, that the Green candidate rose, raised it as an issue, as were LTNs, by the way, uh, raised by the Tory candidate and stuff. And uh, you're, you're, you know, that's the choice between followership and leadership, right? You know, whether you want to follow public opinion or you want to lead it and stuff. If we followed public opinion, we'd bring back capital punishment. Right. British public... Polls regularly show what capital punishment, right? So I think it's really important we, 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 we show leadership. In relation to the buses, you're right, by the way, all the evidence shows poorer Londoners use buses more than they use tubes. It's cheaper. Uh, in those parts of London where they live, there's no tube service and so forth. And so that's why I'm really keen to have more buses in that London. I don't, I don't talk about this much, but it's personal to me because my dad was a bus driver. <laughs> and so, but it's, so we're expanding buses in London, but you're right uh, in relation to making it more affordable for people. In relation to the question uh, at the back, in relation to cycling, look, I want to ask you, you seriously rather than in a flippant way, which is it's very easy to make a generalization based upon the behavior of a small minority. If, if you follow the logic of what you're saying, because a disproportionate number of cyclists are killed by HGV lorries, we should ban all HGV lorries. Yes. Right. <laughs> so speaks the cyclist. <laughs> because they know the danger. Because they know the danger, right? What we're doing instead is making our HGV lorries as safe as possible by having glass cabins, by having a starring system where you can only drive in London if you're vision zero, direct vision standards. You have proper CCTV cameras, making sure there's a noise when it reverses or when it's turning left and so forth, because cyclists are being killed uh, by HGV lorries in disproportionate numbers. By the way, our policy has led to a 50% reduction in, in cyclists being killed or injured, but it's still too many. Uh, and so I'm very careful of making sweep, sweeping generalizations, but you're right. There are too many cyclists not respecting the highway code. You're spot on there. And so we've got to you know, educate a cyclist more. We've got to avoid a situation where there's the pedestrian versus the cyclist or the cyclist versus the car driver. Uh, we've got to avoid this uh, in relation to you know, them and us stuff. Um, and so we're, we're, we are doing more to educate uh, cyclists to follow the highway code. I would say this in a respectful way. Honestly, the massive increase in cycling in our city uh, and, the, and the small number of those breaking the highway code and being a nuisance, um, you know, the numbers are quite small, but it's still, it's still a nuisance. We had somebody who lost their life recently as a consequence of this, so it's very serious and stuff. So I, I do get your point. Uh, but I, I know you weren't saying ban cyclists and stuff, but it's really important that we educate cyclists to do a better job. Can I just, before we end, mm. uh, just say thank, thank you very much for, for, for coming. But, you know, I don't think those of you who are LSE students who work in LSE realise uh, what a phenomenal leader you've had in Minouche as the president over the last uh, few years. I think we're going to miss her hugely uh, when she goes to uh, New York. But my experience of all Londoners who go to anywhere around the world, even if it's the second great city, they always come back. <laughs> So, Minouche is that, that Londoner I call a boomerang Londoner. <laughs> she, she will be back, but Minouche, thank you for what you've done for LSE and for London.
very kind, very kind. You mentioned that good politicians are teachers and, um, and they lead the public and don't just, are not slaves to the polls. And I think that's what you're trying to do in this book, is to provide leadership and teach about an issue that obviously matters a great deal to you. So congratulations, and I do encourage you to read the book because it is readable, human, and is packed full of very practical policy ideas of how to make green urbanism a reality. Can I say, on the, the marathon story, which Manoush touched upon, so yes, of course I ran the marathon, I got asthma as a result, which is really bad. Um, uh, but the good news is, uh, yes, I raised a lot of money for charity, but I beat Ed Balls. <laughs> And Andy Burnham. <laughs> Not that I'm competitive. He does talk about being competitive in the book, actually. There's a whole section about him and his brothers <laughs> being competitive. But I also wanted to thank you for coming to the LSE. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, not just because we're the first carbon neutral university in the UK and are about to build our first net zero building on Lincoln's Inn Fields, which will be a historic first, um, but also because this is my last public event uh, at the LSE. And as someone who has been a devoted Londoner and who loves London deeply, it is very meaningful for me to have you as my final guest. So thank you very much, and please join me in thanking the mayor. <laughs>